All right, ladies and gentlemen, our first keynote is Can Deep Thinking Defeat Tomorrow's Adversaries? Featuring Mr. Gary Kasparov and moderated by Mr. Nicholas Schmidl of The New Yorker. Gentlemen. Great. Um, good morning. Uh, thanks for I, everyone's sort of gripping coffee cups. I feel like I need some fingerless gloves to be maintaining some <laughs> feeling in my fingers at this point. Um, so uh, my name is Nick Schmidl. I'm a staff writer at The New Yorker uh, where I write about uh, a range of issues, but mostly tied some tangential way to the military, national security, uh, and a little bit on international crime. Um, so I do not have a deep technical uh, sort of foundation to be working with. So uh, please, either I, if I offend you, either on the AI or the chess or any technical side, don't throw tomatoes. Um, and I just want to thank uh, West Point and the War uh, Studies Institute for the invitation. This is an amazing opportunity. It's a humbling. Um, uh, opportunity to be able to sit here with Mr. Kasparov and, and, and talk about AI, chess, Russia, information operations, disinformation operations. Uh, so, you know, it is uh, sort of doesn't need much uh, introduction, but, but at the expense of trying to, to state the obvious, um, Mr. Kasparov is, is essentially the, the most dominant chess player of his time, one of the most dominant sort of practitioners of any sport. I was trying to think of parallels and I was kind of pulling up short in many ways. Um, former presidential candidate in Russia and, and now a technologist. So we're going to spend the next hour or so talking about all those issues, about, about the application of AI, about Russian politics, about disinformation operations. And whereas I thought we were off the record, that camera and everyone else are not telling me different things. So uh, just be aware that, yeah, <laughs> whatever, whatever that entails. Um, Look, I, I grew up in the Soviet Union. I'm used to being on 24-7 surveillance. <laughs> <laughs> the, the blinking red light is part of the making breakfast. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you going back to sort of your chess career a little bit, 13 years you were world champion, yes? 15. 15 years. In you went 20 years number one rated player. Yes. You, um, and then before ultimately losing to a computer and being in some ways the first sort of obvious casualty of this, this, this sort of struggle battle with, with artificial intelligence and all, you know, regarding artificial intelligence as a, as a, as a belligerent in some ways. Um, could you talk a little bit about what it was like uh, to sit across from uh, the, the computer that first time? Uh, he made a few statements and I will have to comment on them because let's start with AI. Yeah, I'm, I don't like artificial intelligence. I strongly prefer augmented intelligence for two reasons. One is I believe it's, it's, it's more precise, describing relations between human and machines. Two is artificial sounds scary. And it, uh, it, it fuels this Hollywood uh, uh, brainwashing machine. So just images of the Terminators and Matrix and the killer robots. Um, but that's, you know, uh, but having said that, uh, I should also uh, make a remar remarks about machines that I faced 20 plus years ago. Um, Deep Blue and any other machine of that type, they were not intelligent. They were as intelligent as your alarm clock. A very expensive one, $10 million, but still, it's the, the, you, you can't talk about intelligence uh, where the, the main uh, uh, strength of the machine was the brute force. It, uh, it was quite fast by, by 1997 standards, uh, actually very fast, 200 million positions per second. Though today, if you have a free chess app on your mobile device, it's stronger than Deep Blue. And I'm not even talking about uh, uh, chess engines that you can download on your laptop. They are just way, way, way above Deep Blue's strengths. And uh, just to understand the comparison between the strengths of chess playing engines today and the world champion, Magnus Carlsen, uh, it's my wife. <laughs> <laughs> That's She's watching the, uh, you on know, yes, TV. going to correct you. <laughs> it's the uh, um, and to understand this, this 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 gap is that so the gap between leading chess engines like Stockfish, Commodore, uh, uh, Houdini, and Magnus Carlsen, I mean it's about the same as between Usain Bolt and Ferrari. Just it's the competition is over, and when you look at the history of the of this competition or human machine uh, battles. Uh, it's, I think it's, it, 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 you, you can look at this pattern and to apply it to virtually anything else. To begin with, it looks impossible. Uh, then, you know, machines are laughingly weak. Then it's a short window of, of real competition where machines are strong enough to compete. 
and then they are stronger, much stronger forever after. Um, and uh, um, for those who say, oh, but it's, this is, how could it happen? Because going back to the founding fathers, who all were attracted with the game of chess, Alan Turing, Claude Shannon, Norbert Wiener, they believed that when, not if, when machine would beat uh, best human players, that could be the moment of, uh, sort of the dawn of, of AI. Um, because at the time when, they, when they, they, they tried to tackle the problem in late 40s, early 50s, they couldn't imagine that eventually scientists could have an access to this massive brute force. They had to deal with some, some meager computing power, so they thought that machines had to think. And uh, they knew that chess, for instance, was mathematically infinite game. So by Claude Shannon's own calculations, the number of legal moves in the game of chess ranges uh, at 10 to the 45th power. Big enough. So just to, to call the game infinite. Uh, so um, they just saw that machine had to somehow um, emulate human thinking. So it's um, the, our process of cognition. Um, not just recognizing, and that's a typical mistake for us, that it's not about it's not about machine being perfect, it's about machine being better. And that's, I think, one of the rules that I think we can draw from my own experience and experience of others who faced uh, chess, uh, computers in chess or in Go or in other game. Eventually, every closed system, and when I say closed system, it's a system where we can you know, define the rules and, 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 and put limitations. When there's a clear target, machines will prevail, period. It could take longer than we expected or shorter than we expected, but it's, it's inevitable. Not because they will be perfect, not because they will solve the, uh, the equation, because they will make fewer mistakes. That's it. It's about being better, not about being perfect. And this is one of the mistakes being made by the general public when they talk about driverless cars. Oh, they're not perfect. Absolutely they're not perfect, but statistically they perform better than humans. So this is, I think this, we should just uh, uh, put away these, these kind of prejudices that we expect machines to, 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 to perform 100% perfection. Nothing is 100% perfect. But when you look at, the, at, at, at uh, how close machines could eventually get to, to this perfection, so we should recognize that our role uh, as humans in, the, in this collaboration will change. But up to recent, up to just uh, 2017, everything we saw, I saw, in the machines learning in this world was still, again, going back to Claude Shannon classification, type A machines, brute force. IBM Watson, still brute force. Whatever we do, it's brute force because they had massive computing power, good algorithms, but they have been working with human-generated data. So if we just you know, try to use this kind of just to visualize it, they have been still doing optimization, not transformation. So the things are now changing uh, with the new algorithm uh, that has been introduced uh, less than two years ago. Uh, I don't know how much... You, I've definitely heard about it, but it's, it's, a, it's, it's brand new, so that's why I spent a couple of minutes, you know, uh, just being more uh, um, precise in, in just giving you more details on the story. Uh, it uh, started with the, with the prog pro project run by DeepMind um, uh, group, uh, led by Demis Hassabis. It's, they're working under Google's uh, umbrella from London. Uh, they wanted to uh, crack, quote-unquote, uh, the game of Go, so to beat the best Go players. Since Go is mathematically far more complex than chess, they needed something else. So this, it's a different kind of algorithm. And eventually they succeeded. They just, you know, again, it's, it followed the formula I described a few minutes ago. It's a closed system. They found a way of actually beating Go players. Not very convincing games because, again, the uh, Go is so complex that the level of the top Go players today, probably it it's, uh, could be compared to the best chess players 200 years ago. So that's why even machines being not as strong as the chess engines, it still could actually outperform humans by making fewer mistakes. Call it steady hand. But the real story you know, started next day after they won the match. Then they had, I think, an ingenious idea of trying something else that's never was tried before, at least at the best of my knowledge. How about using the same algorithm, but without any human knowledge, just the rules? that could play against itself, generate its own data, and eventually face the same algorithm that has been equipped with the human knowledge. They call this AlphaGo Zero. And then they had the match between these two AlphaGo algorithms. One was not, not humanized, but used human data. So all the games that humans played, all the patterns. Another one just played against itself. 
self-taught algorithm. They played 100 games. Can you guess the score? 100 0. 100 to 0. Uh, AlphaGo 0 totally trashed AlphaGo. So uh, when I learned about it and I spoke to Demis, I said, look, yeah, phenomenal. But I was not convinced because I said, well, Go is, when you look at the, at the game, it's so complex that is the amount of information that humans could, could, could uh, generate over centuries was not, as, not nearly as, as uh, sophisticated as in chess. Can you try the same trick in chess? Can you try to come up with alpha zero chess? Because in chess, it's something different. So we have data that is just quite sophisticated. And uh, I would love to see alpha, alpha zero playing the best chess engine. They did it. So they, uh, of course, they needed access to Google's uh, enormous uh, computing power. Uh, in a um, few days, AlphaZero played 60 million games against itself. 60 million games. I saw the original games. Total nonsense. It just it started from the absolute scratch. No, not just it, it, it knew only the rules. It kept learning. And uh, after it played 60 million games, it developed its own system of evaluation. That's fundamentally different from anything we saw before. Machine generated its own data, and based on this data, it actually looked at the Factors like material, time, quality, how you could operate you know, with, with, um, with all these equations. And uh, they put it against Stockfish, one of the three leading uh, chess engines. Of course, the experiment was not, uh, was not a pure one. I would argue that they could, they could empower Stockfish with a stronger hardware. They could have um, uh, a, a sort of better opening book. Yeah. Let's say you could train stockfish. You could actually put more power, intellectual power, in the stockfish. But still, the result was amazing. They played 100 games, 28 wins, 72 draws. The stockfish couldn't win a single game in 100 games. Then there were many interesting, many, many interesting developments you know, in the match, because one of them was the style. Because the, or the, the, the conventional wisdom uh, uh, always believed that with machines getting more and more powerful, the chess would be getting more and more boring. Because how can you sacrifice material if it will be refuted? To the contrary, Alpha Zero played very aggressive chess. So, which is, you know, it's, um, it's uh, great. It's, it was music to my, my ears because I used to be a very aggressive, dynamic player. And while many believed that my style was extinct, so I could see actually that the, the, uh, the, the newest chess, chess, chess uh, uh, machine could actually play this very aggressive chess. But it's sacrificing material. It, it, it could actually see this, this very new uh, um, intertwined uh, connections between chess material, uh, between material time and quality that the best engines couldn't actually calculate. Mm. And uh, it was not just that this combination could be refuted. Stockfish uh, still, even with this hardware, uh, operated at the level of 6 million positions per second. Alpha Zero did 60,000, 1%. So which means it, it operated based on its, on its new, new system of e evaluating positions. And, and uh, I, it's, the experiment is still in the process because uh, one of the biggest questions that I, I had is this. So for instance, what would it take for Alpha Zero to um, um, learn from potentially from some losses if it loses one or three games based on, on, on some potentially mistakes in evaluation? How soon it will start? Uh, uh, correcting its original judgment. So, but the fact is that we already got a machine that could actually operate uh, within, within the framework, within the framework um, uh, presented by humans, the rules, and it could come up with, with, with its own data. And uh, I think it's potentially revolutionary because it means that our role uh, in the human-machine collaboration will change, will change uh, uh, quite dramatically. How it, so? How so? Oh, we'll, I would call this the new generation of experts uh, shepherds, because it's basically we will have to, to, to nudge the uh, uh, flock of algorithms. Um, it's, it, seems, it seems quite easy because what oh, you just have to do, you just have to create this, the, the closed system. But to divide an open-ended system into some closed systems where machines can perform most effectively, that will be art. Yes, it's, uh, uh, and uh, um, uh, also, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's, that's, we just have to uh, recognize that the, all the predictions about AGI happening tomorrow, from my perspectives, I'm not the greatest expert, of course, in, in technology, but I see 
not a shred of evidence that is happening. There's no way that the, the, the knowledge, the most sophisticated knowledge accumulated in a closed system could be automatically transferred to an open-ended system. Because at the end of the day, it's about asking questions. It's the, I heard so many presentations by, by experts like from convex optimization. And while machines could generate tons of data, they don't know what is relevant. Because at the end of the day, the trick is when you recognize the, the point that you are crossing the boundaries of and, and reach territory of diminishing return, machine doesn't understand it. So it's still for humans to ask the question and to, and to create these, the limitations where machines could op operate. And that's, for me, it's a first glimpse of AI. So we're talking about something else. And by the way, we could see now that, that Google you know, at, at their driverless car project now, Tesla is following the same, the, 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 the same um, pattern. They are trying to um, um, run these virtual tests. So you can drive millions of miles uh, on the road, but you can drive billions of miles virtually. To, get, to expand their data. To ex exactly, exactly. So you can keep expanding data. It's not perfect. But if you just have, you know, a 10 billion miles versus 1 million miles, so on the road, you, you can create so much data that it will, it will eventually help you to, uh, to um, um, improve, improve the performance. But, it's, but having said that, it's, it's still, it doesn't diminish the role, role of humans because there's still so many moments where machines could get things wrong yeah. just because, again, causation and correlation. So machines do not see the same, the same things that humans could see in, in, in this big picture. So from my perspective, it's just, you know, it's, it's just wrapping up the, present, the, the I'll talk about AI, yeah. is that it's, we, should not, we should not be afraid of that. It's not, uh, AI will not, uh, whether it's augmented or uh, artificial, it's not going to make us redundant. Yeah. I believe we're being promoted. Do you, do you so in light, <laughs> in light of all of that, uh, in which, you know, 95% of it went flying over my head, but I'm tracking on about five. The, uh, the, it does feel, though, like Deep Blue, in a sense, is sort of obsolete. I mean, like the... the oh, it's, it's, it's history. It's but antique. Let me ask you this, though, because there's been a lot of questions. I mean, sort of in terms of the military application of all of this, uh, of, this, of this debate and conversation, there's questions about readiness that have been discussed all morning. How did you prepare, how did you prepare for Deep Blue in a way that you did not prepare for your other matches when you were preparing uh, human uh, again, just, again, just to set up history straight, so this is, that's... I lost the rematch because I yeah. won the first one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's the, now, um, the second match, I have to say that I was, I would say unprepared, but I, I uh, underestimated the progress that IBM could, could, could make over a year from our first match. Um, now, objectively, when we look at the games, now using the far more powerful computers that's, uh, just, that's available today. So uh, I was probably still stronger and the quality of the match was not great, but it was not about being stronger, it's about making better moves. So, and I made more mistakes, or I cracked under pressure. So as that's the, and it's, this was difficult and uh, uh, to play, you know, when you have the uh, front page, uh, the cover story of Newsweek saying, uh, uh, the brain's last stand, no pressure. <laughs> yeah, uh, and, uh, um, and I, um, uh, again, somehow I, I failed to, to, to sort of to evaluate sort of the, the, the right strategy. Uh, it's, it's, it's unfortunate IBM decided to walk away just from, from the rubber match, which I think, you know, I, I deserve. That. But it was, a, it was a bad for science, good for business. So after uh, 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 their, their stock soared 22% uh, uh, over $11 billion in 1997, so in two weeks, so they just realized that the third match would not do, do them any, any good because, again, objectively, I was probably still stronger. So, um, and we, pl we had a few more matches. Yeah, I played two matches with the German program, uh, the Fritz with the Israeli program, the junior in 2003. There were some other matches. And it was, I, I, both of my matches ended, ended uh, 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 as ties. So it's the, uh, and up, up to 2006, we still had these competitions, but by 2006, it was obvious that the, the game, the, the game was over. Yeah. Uh, so um, preparation for machine is, I mean, just it's, it's somehow it's, it's, um, it's similar to, to the humans. You have to look at the games. And my biggest challenge in 1997 was that I didn't have any games to look at. I didn't have the games in 1996. So after 1996, I thought I was smart, and I demanded that in a new contract for the match, uh, I would have access to the, to, the it, it would be contractual obligations for IBM to present it. But, you know, being, a man of the big picture, I didn't look at the fine notes. 
So this is, this is a fine print. So this is the, and which said, you know, games will be available, played in official competitions. And of course, Deep Blue hasn't played a single game outside of the lab. <laughs> so in 1997, I still faced the black box, which is, you know, it's very difficult because you don't know what to expect. So it's the, it's the plus, you know, there were certain other moments there in the match that, that I, I could be far more uh, um, uh, restrictive in my demands. By, by limiting the communication between uh, the programmers and the machine. I mean, for instance, uh, uh, rebooting machine. The what machine? Re rebooting machine. Yeah. So it's this the, so what happens if, if, uh, if machine, uh, 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 it's just, it's, it's frozen. So it's the, I mean, technically speaking, if you, if you want to, to just to, to, have to play the match by the fair rules, so the collapse of the machine is equal to heart attack. Unless it's, unless it's the greed. So, but anything that goes wrong, that's it, you, know, you, you have to forfeit the game. So there were several moments when they rebooted the machine. Again, I treated it as the great social and scientific experiment. They treated is they, they did the match as, you know, as, as just, you know, winning or losing. So that's as yeah. Lou Gerson put it bluntly. Um, so um, we also had experience playing other machines, and that's another mistake that's, that many of us made. Because since 1992, we already had some chess engines that were available for us to play blitz games, then rapid chess, uh, uh, but we didn't expect machines to perform so well in classical chess. So the difference is five minutes chess versus 25, 30 minutes, or seven hours. Now, many machines already uh, uh, you know, inflicted damage to leading players in blitz chess or even rapid chess. I lost to some, some games in blitz, I lost some games in rapid chess, but even for the best chess players, it was very hard to imagine that it was not about time. It just, you know, it's, every human is poised to make mistakes. If you lose five minutes game, if you lose 25 minutes game, you will eventually lose seven hours game. Because even if, even if you could you know, be more cautious, you play you know, higher quality chess, machines will also improve. It's all about humans you know, poised, making, making mistakes. So that's why if you look at the big picture, so the timeline, what's happened in 1997 was kind of a logical conclusion. And it's just, it's like we already had many you know, signs on the wall that we, we just didn't want to read. I want, I, want to, I want to move into <clears throat> Russia stuff uh, in a minute, and then, but I, we will leave enough time for questions. But I did have a, like, you talked a little bit about sort of sitting across from the computer that first time and the unsettling sensation of sitting across. But my, my bigger question that I, I don't know the ego blow in the days after. Like, what, what the, all the realizations of what the technology meant, how did, that, how, did, how did you process that in a day or two after? Like, what, did oh. you just go, Sit in a hole, or no? I, I <laughs> look. I uh, uh, I confessed it in my book, uh, Deep Thinking, and I just said many times, I was and I am the sole loser. Yeah. Period. Yeah, I've seen that yeah, part. Of you. But, yeah. but but not but you're not if you're not a sole loser, so you cannot stay on top for twenty years. Yeah. I mean, you just you need this uh, you know um, this emotional outburst, so this outrage, so after losing, so just to come back. Now. The reason I can hardly answer your question about my feelings uh, of next day or next minute after losing the match to machine, uh, how, how it, was, it was related to, to my understanding of the, of the technology, because it was not the first match I lost to the machine. It was the first match I, lose, I lost, period. It's in 12 years as a world, world champion since 1995 until 1997, I haven't lost, lost a single match. So that's why it's just losing. It was a new experience, right? <laughs> yeah. it's, uh, and uh, um, but still, you know, I I recovered fairly quickly because yes, I was yeah, I was sitting there, sad, pensive, ruminating about the future of the game of chess. So it's, uh, what about and, civilization? Though I mean, that's the bigger that's the, no. But it says I immediately again. Just I re recognize that you know the, the uh, in every uh, just closed system we would we would reach a point where machines would prevail. So it's not about humans versus machine. It's about humans plus machine. So next year, I introduced the game I call Advanced Chess. So how humans plus machine could actually cooperate. So human plus machine versus another human plus machine. That's the game where you could uh, merge, hopefully successfully, the uh, all human qualities, our you know, creativity, intuition, and machines brute force and memory. And we actually had a lot of interesting you know, just results from what I call Advanced Chess, especially online. And uh, one thing that we found, and that's, that's again, that, that applies uh, to, to, to a much broader field, that is not about the strengths of the human player, not the greatest talent, uh, or the fastest machine. 
but it's about the combination. It's about synergy. It's about process. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's what, we, what we could see that is the weaker player with ordinary computer having superior process could actually prevail over stronger player with a faster computer but inferior process. Because at the end of the day, going back just quickly to do alpha zero, I believe in the future the human role will be fine. So the, 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 exactly the, what is needed. So how close machine is to 100% perfection? And what are the machine's deficiency that we can compensate? It's like, you know, being a pilot of Ferrari or just another car. So you have to know exactly what, what your car needs. Yeah. But again, it sounds easy, but you have to know exactly what problem you're trying to tackle. You know, what, what, what are the deficiencies of the machines regarding this problem? And what could you be your contribution? Again, you don't have to be top experts. One of the reasons I think is also psychological, because the moment you know, just you have a top chess player or just you know the best uh, professor in radio radiology, instinctively you want to challenge some of the machine's findings. You know that machine does it better in 95% of the cases, but you cannot help but trying to sort of to to sort of um, uh, uh, instill some of your own own knowledge. You don't have to do it again. This is that you don't, you have to avoid having human ego in the way of just the most effective cooperation. That's why, you know, a chess, a chess playing expert or experienced nurse could be far more effective than a, than a, than a, than a, than a top specialist. Well, the, she the sheep need the shepherds, right? Exactly, I mean, exactly. Yeah. Absolutely, shepherd. But not, you know, just telling, you know, just what kind of grass to eat. Right, right, right. So you mentioned closed societies. Apt uh, system. transition system. point, closed uh, system, well, app, but apt, apt way to transition to Russia. So uh, yeah. <laughs> you, <laughs> yeah, it's the, uh, 2008, you run for president. Okay, that's, you know, again, this is, I have to challenge you. I'm not, I'm not, no, I'm I'm not focusing on the defeat, no, I promise. No, 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 <laughs> I'm, challenge, I'm challenging your definitions because the moment you say running, people immediately in the free world, they immediately th think about having proper campaign, you know, fundraising, debate. It was just, you know, in countries like Russia, it's about making a statement. Yeah. You know, you just, you can get into the ballot if they don't want you. Right. So, but you have to make a statement. 2007, 2008, that's, it, that was what I would call a vegetarian era in Russia. Because for protesting against Putin peacefully on the streets, you could end up in jail for five or ten days, which happened with me a couple of times. Mm. Today, you would be in prison for five or ten years yeah. for doing the same thing. By the way, you don't have to even speak out. You know, it's enough now just to do a repost. Yeah. We have many cases where people get, you know, two, three years in jail for, for reposting on their social media. So just, you know, something that the, that the local, local authorities didn't like. It yeah. may not be money about Putin, but just something that's, that is challenging the local authority. And that's, that's easy now because the people aren't just in, in Russia are just totally not un, unprotected. We're, we're, we're in that, again, in, in that campaign, would your candidacy have advanced how far before you were disqualified? You can, no, it's... It, nowhere. You know, just is the, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's the, one of the, it's, it's one of the, one of the uh, prerequisites of the campaign was that you had to organize a whole of 500 people mm -hmm. so that could sign for your, for your uh, uh, candidacy. So, and then you have to submit the documents to the Ministry of Justice. So, uh, believe it or not, but I couldn't find one in Moscow. Mm -hmm. Eventually, I found one. So, and we paid handsomely. So, we had everything for December 13 fixed. And then the day before, they said, no, technical reasons, we couldn't do it. Of course, on the 14th, in the very same hall, they had one of the, one of the puppet candidates running the same meeting in the same, in the same room. <laughs> so that's, again, and what could you do? I mean, even foreign-owned hotels in Moscow, they were not uh, ready just to, 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 to uh, lend their facilities because, again, yeah. why, why should they endanger their business model? We were talking this morning about uh, the, the playbook that the Russians used in, in Ukraine and, 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 and elsewhere leading up to the, to the application of the disinformation operation here in the US. But there's also been a great deal of research done showing how all of this sort of playbook was used domestically uh, in Russia against, uh, against opponents in terms of feeding false news, dis disinformation, et cetera. Did you see, was that, was that, were you already catching glimpses of it in that time period or was it not? It's early, actually. This is, that's, that's what I want to discuss because I think it's the, the world has overlooked the buildup of this cyber war machine. It started, I would say, 2004, 2005, when, by the way, the, the Russian, they, they called KGB, so whatever the name is now, it's the, they actually saw the moment that when the social networks had been all of a sudden transferred into social media. Two big differences. So this, and they had to make, a, they had to make a, a strategic choice. How to deal with this growing influence of the social media in Russia? So one is, the obvious answer is Chinese model. Build a, Chi build a wall and that's, you know, and, and starve people, you know, with no information available. 
They didn't think it would be very effective, so they actually found something else. So instead of starving people, you can actually you know, provide so much information, the abundance of information, that they will be, it's like a flood. Mm. And uh, they will be lost in this, in this uh, sea of, of, uh, of this data, because at the end of the day, truth is always outnumbered. There's only one way to tell the truth, and you can lie you know, many infinite, in, 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 in infinite ways. Um, now, the idea also was, you know, was based on, on, on the analysis of the Cold War, of this ideological clash, where they tried to sell an ideology. And when you try to sell just a product, so you are always vulnerable because you, know, you have to defend the product. And uh, the product was not good. Mm. And also, it limits your ability to reach out lobbying groups. If you are you know, trying to sell communist ideology, so you, you, cu you, you cut yourself from many potentially disruptive groups in the free world that could help you to, to, uh, to spread the chaos. But what, was, what, was, what, was, what, was the, uh, what were they trying to market? What were they trying okay, to sell? Okay, Marcus, I, I, I always call put a merchant of doubt. Why, why to sell an ideology where you can just basically sell the, sell the notion that truth is not noble? You don't know what it is. So we bet everybody is bad. Democracy is just a fake. It's just being used to cover up the lobbying interest. And also, what they did, for instance, was the, was the message that we, okay, I, what I grew up, you can read it in, in the Pravda newspaper. This is a, the, the headline or the 9 o'clock news. How about dividing this message in 10 and spreading it around? So it's just creating many websites. That's what they did in 2004, 2005. They, st they started creating the constellation of the websites. Many of them looked very legitimate. They, 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 they channeled a lot of real data, information, news, but they all carried a little piece of this, of this poisonous, poisonous story. And it proved to be extremely effective. Because, you know, even if, let's say, we, get, we had 80 million Russians uh, in, in, uh, um, connected to the internet, um, how many of them could use uh, internet for political purposes? Say 15%. I don't mm. think it's more than this. Uh, you're talking about 12 million people. Mm. So, uh, and th but these 12 million people, whatever the number is, so this, they, they, don't, you know, they don't have any, uh, any, any scales to understand so which information is, is, is true, which is false. They just look for something that is not officially government uh, uh, regulated. 80% yeah. of these people, if not more, ended up in this massive network. They also came up with something, yeah, maybe it existed before, but I didn't see it, troll factories. Right. Troll factories in Russia proved to be extremely effective. They could even generate the whole debate on the page. I already could see some sort of called hashtags. One of the first ones they always use, you know, Mr. Kasp, it's not that they're attacking me all the time, it's they have, they're debating each other. But the first line I see immediately, I have a great respect for you as a chess champion. I know what's, what's coming next. <laughs> yeah, that's it, that's it. And, and, and there are many things that you could, but, but this is, but, I was shocked to see that just how sophisticated was the system. Because it, and it could easily mislead even, even just you know, an educated person who just enters the page, oh, arguments here and there. No, it's all generated. Mm. So they, they succeeded in Russia by creating this massive space that they controlled. They, of course, they pushed a lot of traffic there. So basically pushing uh, the, uh, the sort of the true liberal media, uh, internet media, just into some sort of a ghetto. So we just couldn't. In this, out of this potentially 12 million, maybe we could get 2 million, which you know, means that you know, at, the best, uh, at the peak of the demonstrations, you can have maybe 100,000 people on the street, which is roughly the right percentage. But, but we couldn't actually leave it because uh, this, 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 this space, control space, since they, they, it's, you know, for a lot of people, you know, that's the, the state, uh, secretly state-run media, created you know, uh, sort of more quality news. And yeah. it, it looked more attractive. Now, next step, what they did, Russian-speaking neighborhoods like Estonia, uh, Baltic countries, Ukraine, and then they moved to Europe, to Eastern Europe. So I've been shouting in the desert saying they, will, they would end up attacking America because that's, that's, that's the natural progression. They kept building it. When they attacked the U.S. election, they already had more than 10 years of experience. So what you saw here, it was just, you know, uh, it's, an, it's an application of the quite sophisticated system that has been tested in Russia, in Russian-speaking world, and even in, 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 in uh, Eastern and, and and, and Western Europe. So it was not just, you know, they, they, they tried it. So they already had so many, uh, they learned so many patterns, and they actually knew how to, how to um, attack the, the, the target audience. Because when you look at 2016 elections, they were not so much pushing Trump's votes. Actually, they were trying to undermine 
Hillary's rules. There was, so that's to get basically to spreading doubts and just, you know, and, 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 and uh, um, pinpointing the, 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 right, the, the, the right areas on the map. So recognizing that that's the, the where they can, they can make the biggest impact. There was a question, uh, a couple, there were some interesting points raised at previous panels that I, that I wanted to kind of bring forward to this one. One of them was, are we at war right now? Yes. It's, it's, you don't like to hear that, but that's, that's from Putin's perspective, we're at war for, for a long time. Because he just recognized, again, maybe he's not that smart, but he's street smart. And as every dictator, he, he learned, yes, that's, it's, that's a very simple rule. When your domestic agenda is exhausted, you needed enemies. No more enemies in Russia, no one to blame inside the country. You need enemies. And you need big enemies. Bigger the enemy is, so this is, uh, the, the, the more arguments you can find uh, for, for your domestic propaganda to sort of undermine human liberties and basically to, to, to exercise full control. So that's why America, it was just, it was a natural choice. Anti-American propaganda has not stopped even during the years of so-called reset policy, which can infuriate me because you just had Russian television stepping up with anti-American rhetorics while U.S. administration desperately tried to find common ground. So just you look at the official statistics. That's run by Kremlin's own uh, uh, um, polling stations. So um, the, uh, last year, they just, uh, or maybe earlier this year, they just had this data released. So it's the, it's the Russians have been asked about enemies. Yeah, of course, most of Russians said they were enemies. And who is enemy number one in Russia? The United States of America. Something like 65 percent. So that's that's an enemy. You could you, you choose more than one. But now, what was the second enemy? Ukraine. Ukraine, second enemy, 28 or 29 percent. Mm. But if I tell you this, you know that's, that's the, If I ask you to name the third one, I don't think you can even I mean, you can even guess. It's European Union. Ahead of NATO, way ahead of NATO. So it's all about reflection of what they hear from television. By the way, in year 2000, when they had anti-American feelings, you know, that that's was like 21%. Ukraine was not on, on the radar at all. 40% Islamic terrorism. What happened with radical Islam today? 4%, because it has disappeared from the television. So again, it's, just, it's all about manipulating, and they're quite good at that. So again, what they also know is that it's not, you know, it's not one message even for domestic audience. You have. Nine o'clock news, you have all these talk shows. They all talk about America, Ukraine. By the way, every time they talk about Ukraine, it's not about Ukraine being an enemy. Ukrainian puppets of America, America that are trying to undermine Russian influence. This, it always ends up with America. So, but they also know that there's about 10 or 15% of the population that doesn't buy the story. So how you deal with these people? You have to create a new class of journalists that, that could be trustworthy. And again, they all carry one story. For instance, you want one journalist to tell stories that KGB had nothing to do with apartment bombing in 1999, had nothing to do with, the, with murders of Litvinenko. Or just, nobody will trust this journalist unless this journalist can blast Putin on some of the radio stations for corruption. Mm. The same person goes after Rottenberg brothers, Abramovich, and blasting Putin all the time. But when it comes to KGB and, and, and apartment bombing, this person, it, inevitably, he or she, they have certain trust. Because they just, you know, they were, in 99% of the cases, they sound exactly as, as Gary Kasparov. Mm. So, again, they are, they are very subtle. And I think that the, the free world was not ready for this kind of, of uh, propaganda war that was so different from what we learned during the, during so the years of the Cold War. Let me ask one more question, and we'll open it up uh, to, to um, the rest of the room. You've talked about sort of uh, uh, the U.S. and the West lacking the moral courage to, 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 to combat the Russians. More of political will. Yeah. So, okay. Well, so there in, in, in late 2016, there were there were reported discussions inside of the National Security Council about uh, countering Russia's disinformation campaign by hacking uh, emails from senior Russian leadership and releasing them in a compromising manner. And the ultimate uh, decision, and one that was discussed in the previous panel, is that that sort of is we are that is not of our those are not our values. How do you? How do you show moral courage to combat an enemy that's engaged in disinformation without losing your own? Yeah, I don't understand when you talk about values at the time of the war. So I could men mention many things that happened during World War II that were not our values. Dresden, you know, just you start counting things that c could be avoided. It's a war. 
And thanks God, Dr. Goebbels had no access to CNN, just to, to appeal to American public opinion about the cruelty of, 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 of uh, uh, American uh, carbon bombing. Um, so they actually, it's going back to, 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 uh, to uh, Putin and, and his information war, is a judo expert. So they, they actually found a way to use the freedom of speech so it just, and a free society to their advantage. It's just a, how to use the strengths of the opponent just to, to attack the opponent. The irony is that the, the uh, technology that has been invented in the free world has been used extensively by the enemies of the free world to undermine the very foundation of our, of, of, of our democracy. And uh, um, regarding this as the, the, the measures in 2016, I think it was quite late already because you just, let's learn from history. So I'm, by now I'm just finishing reading The Gathering Storm of Winston Churchill. I'm a big fan of him, but I, his, his writings, but that's the first time actually I got this book and I just, it's when you read about the 20s and especially the 30s and the speeches you know, of, of leading politicians in, 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 in Great Britain, I mean, you could be shocked, you know, just erase a few names and you can simply, you know, uh, uh, copy paste it to, to, to many moments now when they talk about cooperation, economic cooperation with Germany and the, the unilateral disarmament of, of Great Britain to the level of Germany could actually prevent Hitler. Of the, it's insane, but I have certain respect for these people because they didn't know what was coming. So what Chamberlain did in 1938 was just a logical continuation of this policy of avoiding war at any cost. And what we learn from the 30s and what we're learning now is that every day that we delay our response, every day we try to ignore their, the brazen attacks, the price goes up. It's at certain point you can make a threat. That's, that's what is very important that you have a credibility in, in, in the office, in, let's say in the Oval Office. Mm. And uh, you know, when Reagan said tear down this wall, I was serious. When Harry Truman spoke, Stalin, Stalin was listening. I mean, he knew the man just was you know, ready to make decisions. And it's, uh, it's probably worth, worth remembering that in 1951, at the opening chapel of the four chapels in Philadelphia, Harry Truman, among other things, said, we cannot afford to lead forces of uh, our freedom from behind. Mm. Mm. That's the, mm. it's an amazing, you know, just an amazing con connection with, with modern days. But if you don't do things you know, at a time where you could stop aggression at a low cost, then eventually you know, things will get worse. I remember I was at, uh, at uh, um, the last word of Lawrence O'Donnell uh, uh, on MSM, uh, uh, MSNBC after uh, this infamous red line in Syria. And I told him bluntly, and he was, was defending Obama administration, the cost of, of this decision you know, could be enormous. It's not only Middle East, you know, it could go beyond you know, Middle East because that's a signal that they could actually cross any red line. Mm. And by the way, he says that Putin hasn't created every crisis in the world, but he's a good opportunist. He just look an opportunity to use it for his own advantage. For instance, Syria was a perfect moment. A, he could have saved Assad, which is very important because Obama said in 2011, Assad must go. Putin said, uh-uh. Now, where is Obama, where is Assad? Right, today? right, right. Well, and it's so, also worth remembering that, yeah, the Russians didn't create racist in the United States. Exactly. No, but, no, but, yeah, that's, but that's, it. and then, and then it, when you saw Obama's, Obama's uh, indecisiveness and the, the, the free world, you know, waffling about interference in Syria, A, he saved Assad, yeah. which demonstrated, you know, just to, to every other dictator in the world that Putin is a man of the world, but B, he saw another opportunity, refugees. Hmm. So if you bomb the hell out of them, so Aleppo has been destroyed with the free world just being silent and Kerry wasting his time talking to Lavrov about peaceful resolution. Chemical weapons, carpet bombing, and you have millions of civil refugees. The effect, look at the European political map. Yeah. You have, it, Germany is still economically, it's, I'm not, it's probably striving. So it just, it's, there are no economic challenges. And you have 94 neo-Nazis in, in, in the Bundestag. The third largest fraction in, in, in Bundestag it's just, you know, it's, it's a party that is not hiding its, its, its neo-Nazi roots. How come? What about one million refugees that had been brought by Merkel? Yeah. So that's, it's, and Putin recognized immediately refugees could be, you know, it's, 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 it's a golden mine for him because they could change the political landscape in Europe, helping him to create, to create uh, chaos throughout the whole continent. Let's uh, uh, open up the room. We've got 15-ish minutes, 14-ish minutes for questions. Um, Max? Yes. Which I think is a perfect metaphor for this conference because as much as we study our enemies, Russia, China, there are going to be black boxes. There are going to be enemies that will come out of nowhere. In your opinion, emotionally, psychologically, what are the conditions that we need uh, to 
be able to face these enemies that we have no record of <laughs> Yes, I mean, I think we have now more data available than I had in 1997. Uh, and also, we know the sources, if not, you know, of direct you know, attacks, but also the sources that are behind these attacks. That's, that's uh, amplifying these attacks, providing resources. It's called deterrence. We had nuclear deterrence. It's time to actually have this, uh, the, the, the deterrence in, 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 uh, uh, in cyberspace. Because, the, uh, again, America is in the position to, to, uh, to decimate the, the, the Russian or Chinese infrastructure. The problem is you have to, you, you, you must have a credible leadership that could make a threat because you don't want to use it. And I think we reached a point where simply telling Putin we would do it is not going to fly. But how, but what is, but how, do you, how do you credibly deter without revealing uh, your, the, the, your, the extent of your penetration inside of an adversary's network? Look, again, you don't want to, you don't want to, reach, you don't want to reach a point where you just have to, uh, to actually you know, uh, demonstrate your strengths. Uh, unfortunately, again, we are probably you know, already crossed few stations where you could do it by simply telling them, stop. Right. At the war, you know, you have to expose yourself because it's at the end of the day, I mean, let's be ob objective. It's this defense is a losing proposition. You cannot defend your infrastructure. <laughs> so it's, I don't know about a conventional war, but not in cyber war. This, I know enough to understand that every system, you know, is, is vulnerable. I spoke at DEF CON uh, last year. So, and one of the, uh, one of the uh, um, called competitions there was uh, for their, you know, top hackers to, to, uh, to hack an, elect an election machine, less than three hours. So that's again, it's, it, every system would be penetrated. And I'm not, not talking about American uh, uh, electoral infrastructure being inadequate, but anything is, is vulnerable. Unless, unless the, the opposite side understands that there will be consequences, uh, <laughs> you'll be in trouble because they, just, they keep stepping up. Yeah. It's just, it's happened with every dictator, you know, it's just, it's they, if they could do this, so why not? Because they don't ask why. They always ask why not. From Hitler's perspective, attacking Poland was no different from attacking Czechoslovakia. So why, why, why the Brits? He was generally shocked that the Brits and French, they just declared war because, so what's the point? I'm just attacking in the opposite direction. Why, guy, why, why, why you care about Poland? So you gave up Czechoslovakia last year. So, I mean, let's, you know, let's, let's work it out. Right. And, uh, and I think that's from Putin's perspective is also, if, if I can do this, why not? So he succeeded in winning so many elections already. After Italian elections, I said it's the first elections, he won fair and square. <laughs> uh, question back here? Doctor? Um, you know, uh, as much as I want to stay, you know, in the games that have, you know, uh, not just rules, but 100% transparent information like chess and go, now we're probably talking more about poker, where you just, you know, you don't have the full information available, you have some data, but it's very much psychological game. It's about who blinks first. And, uh, uh, and it, you know, in chess, you know, you play, you, or in go, uh, or even in Dota, when just you play, you know, just in some video game. So it's this, if you are superior in just making the, so the best moves, you know, the, the best clicks, so you will prevail. In poker, you can win with a weak hand, providing, you know, you can bluff and you can raise the stakes. And unfortunately, you know, we reached a point where the opposite side, that having a very weak hand, I still believe Putin has a weak hand, but even with a pair of five, if you have enough money to raise the stakes, and, 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 and still nerves to, 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 to bluff, you can beat if opponent keeps folding cards. And I think we reached a point where, you know, it's, it's not just even the strengths. Everyone understands that there's plenty of strengths on this side, but there's no political will. And uh, what they re realized, I don't know about Chinese, so I'm not an expert in China, but I think they're learning from Russians. 
that the, the best way to win this war is to weaken America from within. And let's, let's, be, let's, uh, let's give them credit. They have been doing a great job. So this America is preoccupied you know, with, with, its, with the own battles. And uh, while there is the consensus uh, in Washington, uh, with few notable exceptions about, about Russia, uh, it's the, uh, um, uh, it's, you know, the, the general public has been divided. And it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's very difficult even just to, 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 to debate, I mean, to talk about some, the, the, the truths because it's all about, it's, it's, it's a tribalism that, that, that is running the show. And uh, similar things happening uh, in Europe. It just, it's, you can see, for instance, the Great Britain. So on one side, you have uh, uh, Brexiteers that are just, you know, they're doing their, their best to topple uh, 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 um, Mrs. May's government, which means that, you know, we, we are, might, be, might be seeing a moment soon enough with, with a socialist and terrorist sympathizer, Jeremy Corbyn, entering down, Downing Street 10. So what we, what's happening now is that, you know, the political center in most of the uh, free world has been decimated. And you always have a choice between one extreme or another. And that's, you know, that's one of the greatest achievements of the KGB game. And uh, unless we just recognize that it's, it's, it's a game for survival. I think one of the problems after 1991 was that we didn't believe that the fight, uh, were, yeah, we were fighting existential enemies. We are. And it's, I think it's uh, even more dangerous because they know how to fight from within. So they, they have so many allies that they never had before. Okay, they were always infiltration. But it's the first time when they could actually go in any direction. So right or left, by looking only for, for those who could help them to sow chaos. Yeah. Do we have, can we, can we run five over since we started five minutes later or are we sticking to noon? Okay, uh, all right, so in the corner. I, uh, as a non-American, probably I can afford politically incorrect statements. Uh, unfortunately, I think President Trump has learned a lot from Putin already. I mean, following the, 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 the tweet storms and, and the way that is just the, the very notion of truth has been uh, attacked from different angles. It's, uh, it reminds me a lot about, uh, about um, uh, the way that Putin has been handling the truth through his... Uh, through, through, his, through different channels. So it's the only difference here is that you have one, one Twitter that can just, you know, that can beat any, any spam filter. Um, but uh, it's quite amazing that it's very often I could see that some of the hashtags of Russian propaganda, for instance, rigged elections, they have been repeated all the time. And, uh, and uh, I, uh, you know, it's just, I found, even with my meager resources, I could found many cases were uh, the so-called MAGA accounts had been directly linked to Russia. So one of the stories that I, I, I bring, it's, it's unfortunately I have no, no uh, 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 projector here, it's uh, when Vitaly Churkin died. Uh, the the so, yeah, Russian, Russian ambassador, Russian ambassador in, 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 in the United Na in Nations. So it just, it's all of a sudden, you know, just it's by accident, so just working with, 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 uh, with my associates. So we just found out that there was the, the, the flood of MAGA accounts having it as a, as a top news. They're, these are and these are them. And yeah, they're, exactly. all, they're all. They're yeah, all. They're all. Says, you know, yes, right. or from Oklahoma, Kansas, Wyoming. I'm just from just people that have never heard of Churkin. It's in eight minutes, somebody in St. Petersburg, in the, this, it's their headquarters, realized they made a mistake and they stopped it. But we get we, we saved two screens. So you, you can just see that it's just it's the it's it, there's somehow this the, this uh, this this um, uh, narratives are interlinked, and. Uh, uh, and I, again, the problem of fighting them is that it's people are not listening to each other. So that's why, again, it's those who are listening to Fox News, they will never just hear any argument. Or the other way around, by the way. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's, quite, it's quite a challenge. And again, we reached a point where you need, you know, you need something very 
very drastic measures to recover uh, the confidence of the world that America, America will still uh, will still take a lead. So is this? It's uh, because people. I mean, I, all the time I hear is complaints. So it's this, uh, that's the uh, uh, well, it's uh, America's a world policeman. Okay, so you don't have a policeman. So what about living in city without policemen on the beat? So just people don't recognize that most of the things that we are actually facing now is just the result of of the fact that America is again, trying to lead from behind. It doesn't work. So, so on, as, a, as a final, very, very final question, if you had five minutes with the president, with President Trump, to, to you said you, that drastic measures are needed. What would, one minute with the president, what would, the, what, would those drastic, what would those drastic measures be? If we've crossed the line so many times and there's not been, what, what, how, how drastic does it need to be to be able to deter at this point? Uh, yeah, one minute probably now. Was Trump, so it's just it's, it's 280 characters. Uh, uh, stop praising dictators and uh, start just criticizing Putin and don't meet him anymore. Don't grant him uh, a luxury of, of a summit, which is just it's it's even without you know uh, all the negatives uh, that could be seen you know on the Helsinki meeting. It's just the very fact that they meet gives Putin tremendous boost at home. So dictators, they always thrive when they have this opportunity of just of presenting themselves as, 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 as a big man. And uh, while Putin is, is capable of, of, uh, of presenting himself as uh, equal, if not superior to Trump, so that helps him, uh, uh, helps him uh, at home um, to survive any, any, any domestic challenge. So again, it's very simple. Stop doing certain things. You know? I just don't want Trump even to, 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 to sign any executive orders or just initiate attacks. Just cutting some of the most uh, the outrageous elements of his behavior towards Putin would help dramatically. That sounds doable. So thank you all very much. Appreciate <laughs> it. <laughs> you are an optimist. <laughs> yes.